Amen. Go ahead and take a seat. If you have your Bible or your Bible app, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 24. We're going to start looking at verse 36 today. Uh, if you don't have a Bible with you, you're welcome to use one of the Bibles under the seats in front of you. And you'll find Luke chapter 24 on page 1052. We are continuing in our sermon series called The Son of God. And this is the last weekend for our Easter emphasis. Now, if you don't have a Bible at your house that you're able to read or understand easily, please, uh, please be encouraged to take one of our Bibles home with you. We don't want you just to have a copy of the Word of God in storage at your house somewhere. We want you to have a copy of the Word of God that you can read, that you can understand easily, because we believe if we read God's Word and apply His Word, he will truly change our lives. That, that's what God does. In fact, if you've applied God's word to your life and you've experienced God changing your life as a direct result of applying his word to your life, would you raise your hand and let the people around us know? See, that's amazing. That, that's, that's what, in fact, our mission is here at Calvary. It's to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. See, we don't want to just see you uh, attend church. We want to see your life radically changed through a relationship with Jesus. And it's been really exciting to see that happen over the last few weeks. The week leading up to Easter, roughly, I think, 46, 47 teenagers gave their lives to Jesus. They surrendered their lives to Christ. Then over Easter weekend, that, that's awesome, we can clap. Then over Easter weekend... I guess if I'm going to say you can clap, i got to give you time to clap. <laughs> then over Easter weekend, we saw 16 or 17 people baptized, professing to the world. They'd given their life to Jesus, and they wanted to be baptized. Then the following week, we saw in our student ministry seven or eight baptisms down at the lake. Then Calvary Christian Academy, our Christian school, they are going to have a, a baptism celebration, and they've got six or seven students lined up for that. It's incredible to see people surrendering their lives to Jesus and then following through with baptism. Now, baptism is a statement to our family. It's a statement to our friends. It's a statement to our community that we really have surrendered our lives to Jesus. And it's the very first step for a follower of Jesus. So if you've not yet been baptized but you have surrendered your life to Jesus, what are you waiting for? Uh, why are you hesitant about letting the world know you've surrendered your life to Jesus? You're not embarrassed about it. You're not shy. Could it be possible that the reason you have not yet been baptized is because Maybe you're not really sure you surrendered your life to Jesus. Maybe you're not really sure you've experienced a life-changing moment when you gave your life to Jesus. Maybe you're holding back from getting baptized because you're afraid that maybe somehow you're wrong and God is going to be upset with you. Or maybe somehow you're wrong and maybe you'll let people down around you. Maybe you're afraid that you really haven't given up that old life that you once lived because you're experiencing temptation to keep doing some of the th same things that you were doing. Maybe you're afraid that somehow you'll get baptized, fall back into your old way of living, and somehow embarrass people around you. Maybe you're not so sure about this changed life after all. Well, the disciples of Jesus kind of felt the same way. They'd been through a lot of emotional pain. They'd been through a lot of, uh, of spiritual doubt. They'd been through some highs and some lows with Jesus. Before Jesus came along, the disciples of Jesus were living their lives just fine. Now, they weren't disciples at that point. They were anonymous. Nobody knew who they were. They were fishermen. They were tax collectors. Uh, they had nothing to do with religiousness or religious leaders. They had jobs. They were under the radar of the religious leaders. They had families. 
They were okay in life. Then Jesus showed up and said, come follow me. Then their lives were radically changed supernaturally. For some reason, they said, okay. And they left their jobs and they left everything and they began to follow Jesus. Jesus ruined their lives by inviting them to follow him. For the next three years, Jesus showed them what was really missing from their lives. He taught them scripture. He taught them God's plan. He talked about grace and mercy and forgiveness. He, he worked miracles. And Jesus even gave those same disciples the power to work miracles as well. The same power that flowed through Jesus when that woman reached out and touched the hem of his garment, Jesus gave to his disciples. And he said, go out and heal people, cast out diseases and sickness. And those disciples who were just ordinary guys until Jesus showed up, they were walking around town casting out sickness, casting out diseases. These same guys that once cast nets were now casting out sickness. It was an amazing change that they experienced. But that feeling of change disappeared when they saw Jesus murdered by the Jewish leaders and the, and the Roman authorities. They saw Jesus' lifeless body hanging on the cross. With their own eyes, they saw him wrapped in burial cloths. They saw him placed in a tomb and a rock rolled in front of it. And this changed life that they were experiencing, this hope that they had in their lives, this, man, I can't believe we get to do this for our future. This is incredible. All of a sudden, the source of their hope was dead. Everything that they imagined their life was going to be with Jesus was gone. For three days they mourned. Three days they grieved. Three days they experienced darkness and hopelessness. Then Jesus rose from the dead and their hope sprang back to life. Jesus rose from the dead and they're like, oh man, it's back. We're back on guys. The, the, Jesus is back. That source of our power, source of our hope is here. It's on. And Jesus said, well, I'm only here for a few more days and then I'm gonna leave you again. I'm actually risen from the dead, but I'm going back to my father. They had hope and then doubt and then discouragement and then hope and then more doubt and discouragement. And if you wrestle with the doubt that Jesus did change your life, if you wrestle with doubt that Jesus brought lasting change to you when you surrendered your life to Jesus, I hope that today's message is an encouragement to you because the disciples in this passage of scripture were in a similar situation. We're going to begin reading in Luke chapter 24. The disciples were standing around and they were talking about Jesus, about the resurrection. And verse 36 as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do, you, why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet. That is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it before them. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened up their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. 
while he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. From the very beginning of the Gospel of Luke to the very end of the Gospel of Luke, we see miracle after miracle after miracle. From the angels announcing his virgin birth to Jesus' first miracles to the miracles throughout the Gospel to the very end, right before Jesus ascended into heaven, he was performing miracles. Did you catch the miracle that Jesus performed in this passage of Scripture? It wasn't a miracle of eating a piece of broiled fish. It wasn't a miracle of saying, hey, look at my hands and look at my feet. Jesus' final miracle is performed in this passage. He opened up their minds to understand Scripture. It was like all of a sudden Jesus, you know, reached in supernaturally and flipped a switch and they understood then Scripture. And if you, have, uh, if you have surrendered your life to Jesus, it is because and only because God has opened your mind to understand the Bible. God has opened up your mind to understand the Bible. God has already worked a miracle in your life. If you're sitting back saying, well, I'm waiting for God to change me. I'm waiting for God to do something. He's already done it. He's already flipped a switch on in your mind that moment that you surrendered your life to Jesus, that moment that you received Jesus as your Savior, a switch came on and Jesus worked a miracle because he gave you the ability to understand Jesus. He gave you the ability to understand the death and the resurrection. Time and time again throughout Scripture, we see Jesus bringing healing to people who were in need, people who were desperate, people who felt they had no hope. He healed people who were disfigured. To the lame person, he said, stretch out your hand and let me heal it. To the person who, or to the this one with a disfigured arm, to the one who was lame, he said, get up, take your mat and go home. To those who were blind, Jesus said, I give you sight. To those with leprosy, he said, I'm healing your body. To those who were deaf, Jesus said, now you can hear. And they could. Miracle after miracle after miracle. And now in order for Jesus to truly convince his disciples that he was the Savior that the Old Testament prophesied about, Jesus had to do one final miracle, which was to open up their minds. He didn't stand there with his arms crossed and lecture them and try to persuade them of the truth. He didn't yell at them to make them understand. The Bible tells us he opened up their minds to understand the Bible. Now, this is why I think it's crazy. The, the disciples had once been Jewish boys and these Jewish boys were required by the Jewish education system to memorize the first five books of the Old Testament. That's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They were required to memorize all five books of the Bible before they turned 10 years old. These Jewish disciples already knew the Torah, the first five books. They had committed to memory all 80,000 words of the, those first five books. Most likely, these men attended synagogue each and every week. They would show up. The religious leaders would teach them something from the, the Psalms or something from uh, the, the Torah. They would teach them something from the Old Testament, explaining Scripture to them. Even though they attended the synagogue for worship and for teaching each and every week, even though they had memorized 80,000 words of hope, even though they spent roughly three years with Jesus, listening to his teaching, watching him perform miracles, even though they themselves worked miracles, 
it still required Jesus to open up their minds. They were still limited in their understanding of Scripture. They knew that God created them. They knew that Adam and Eve chose to sin. Uh, they knew that all descendants of Adam and Eve sinned. They knew they were sinners. There was a time when Peter looked at Jesus and said, get away from me, I'm a, I'm a sinful man. They knew that sin had entered the world. They knew they were sinners. They knew they were separated from God. But they still didn't understand why Jesus died on the cross. They still didn't understand why Jesus rose from the dead until that moment, that instant, when Jesus opened up their minds so that they could understand. They heard, but they didn't understand. They heard, but they truly didn't get it. And if you're a parent, that probably reminds you of your children. I feel like Christy and I spend half our, our parenting moments saying to our children, didn't you hear me? Did you hear what I just said? What did I just say? How many more times do I need to say it? I feel like that's how much, I feel like we spend 80% of our time trying to remind our kids of something they've already heard, but they didn't apply, or things they've already seen, but they didn't really perceive. And can I tell you, they get it from us. They get it from their parents, and we have it because we're all just designed that way. I mean, we all, it takes a while for us to get it. It's a common problem throughout the history of man. God said to the prophet Ezekiel in Ezekiel 12 too, Son of man, you live among rebels who have eyes, to, who have eyes but refuse to see. They have ears, but they refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious people. Now, I, I grew up Catholic. I knew from an early age that God had created me. I knew from an early age that God had created the world and the galaxies and the stars. I understood that Jesus paid the price for my sin on the cross. I understood that Jesus rose from the dead, but nothing in me changed until God opened up my mind so that I could truly understand how to apply what I knew and surrender my life to Jesus. And if you've surrendered your life to Jesus, it is only because God has opened up your mind to understand the hope that's found inside the Bible. See, that's why you should live with confidence. You don't have to sit around waiting for God to work a miracle in your life to rescue from an addiction. God has already worked a miracle in your life if you surrendered your life to Jesus. God can point to all of his angels and everything in creation. He can point you out and say, they get it. They understand. I've opened up their mind so they would place their hope in me. That's why you can confidently step, uh, take your next step of faith into the waters of baptism. God has worked a miracle in your life. And another way that you can know for certain that Jesus is present in your life, that he has changed you, is that you demonstrate forgiveness through visible change. You demonstrate forgiveness through visible change. In verse 47, Jesus said, repentance and forgiveness of sins must be proclaimed from all, uh, to all the nations. Now, repentance and forgiveness are two separate words that communicate one idea. And sometimes people get confused with the word repentance. They think that uh, they live their lives thinking that repentance is living with remorse and guilt and shame over their past life. They, they, they sit around and think, well, I'm a, I've got to feel sorry. Lord, I'm so sorry. I'm a, I'm a wretched worm. I can't believe this is my life. I'm repenting and I'm feeling guilty and I'm feeling shame. Can I just tell you that I've never seen a person who walks around with shame and guilt live a victorious life in Jesus? They, they are not experiencing what repentance truly is. See, very simply put, all repentance is, is a change in direction. 
Let's suppose you're in your car and you decide that when you leave church today, you want to go to Parker. But instead of going north, instead of going south on 95, you go north on 95. And you go through Lake Havasu City and you hit the other side of town. You're going past Walmart. You're hitting close to I-40. Then you realize, oh, I'm not headed to Parker. I've made a wrong turn. I've, I'm going the wrong way. So what do you do? Do you keep driving the wrong way or do you make a U-turn? You make a U-turn. That's exactly what I do. And don't say you don't know what a U-turn is. <laughs> don't sit in here with your pious hearts and be like, I've never committed a law-breaking U-turn in my life. <laughs> See, if you really want to get to Parker before you run out of gas, you're going to have to make a U-turn. You're going to have to admit that you're going the wrong direction, change the course of your direction, turn the car around, and drive south. That is what repentance is. When you repent, when you surrender your life to Jesus, you make a U-turn in life. And there are going to be visible signs that God changed the direction of your life through forgiveness. If you're sitting around waiting to become perfect, it's never going to happen. If you say, well, I don't want to be baptized because I'm afraid I'm not perfect, I have news for you. You are not perfect. You are going to choose to sin again. But there are some visible signs that God has changed you. There are some visible signs that you have been forgiven for your sins. It's the desire you now have a desire to please God that wasn't there before. You now have a desire to walk with him. You have a desire to grow in your relationship with God that never existed before. You, you have a desire to walk away from your old life. See, your desire and your want to has changed. And the reason why you're even wrestling with the thought of being baptized is because God has given you that desire to be baptized. See, God is at work in your life. If you hadn't been changed, you would have no desire to tell the world you're a follower of Jesus. But because you have been changed, you have been forgiven for your sins, you have surrendered your life to him, that's a sign that God has changed you. And you're going to begin to show signs that you reject that sinful lifestyle that you once had, but you're not going to live perfectly from day one. In fact, from day 1,000, you're not going to live perfectly. You can't sit around and wait for your life to get cleaned up before you take that next step of obedience in it to him. For instance, I've seen people who struggled with alcohol addiction. I'm not saying that they had a drink every now and then. They were addicted to alcohol. They would consider themselves an alcoholic. I've seen them surrender their lives to Jesus and never have a desire again for alcohol. They, they lived differently from that day on. They never touched a drop from that day forward. Yet I've also seen people surrender their lives to Jesus. They'd been alcoholics and they still struggle with that addiction to alcohol. They still give in to that addiction to alcohol. They were changed. They were made new. They surrendered their life to Jesus, but they still struggled with sin. But I guarantee you this, they've changed in other ways. God's changed them. God's blessed them. There is a visible sign that they have changed and been transformed there are some things, some sins that you're going to immediately stop doing, but there may be other sins that it takes some time to overcome. But the difference is there is an inward change in your life because you have been forgiven for your sin. Now that word forgiven, that's a mathematical term. It was used back in the day when an individual borrowed money from a lender, their name was written down on a book or in a ledger. And as the person made payments to what he owed, the payment was subtracted and a new balance would be recorded in its place. And wherever the lendee went, he carried that book, that ledger. And when he saw the individual coming, he would flip it open and remind him, you owe me money. 
Here's your name. Here's what you owe. But if the lender forgave the debt, he would open up that book. He would blot out their name. He would blot out the amount. It was erased. It was as though it never existed. So the person that borrowed the money was no longer in bondage to the lender. They were no longer loaded down with that debt. They were free. Whenever they saw that guy coming, they did not have to be held back by fear. They knew they'd been set free. God has dealt with your sin the exact same way. If you've surrendered your life to Christ, if you've received Jesus as your Savior, it is as now as though your sin has never existed. Jesus erased the penalty for your sin from history. God does not hold it over your head to shame you, to embarrass you, and you should not live bound by guilt and remorse either. You don't need to live loaded down with guilt and the weight of your past. You have been set free. So make a choice to live like it. Make a choice to live as though you've been set free. Embrace the freedom that God has given to you through Jesus. Demonstrate the freedom of forgiveness through visible change in your life. One visible change is to take that next step toward, uh, towards Jesus through baptism. Take a step to serve. Take steps to invite others to worship with you because you've been forgiven. You are living debt free. Let the world know Jesus has changed your life. Now, one of the things that I love about our faith is that then Jesus didn't leave you alone to let you figure out life on your own. The moment that you surrendered your life to Jesus, the moment you received forgiveness for your sins, you also received the Holy Spirit in your life. You can live with confidence about your next step. Not only has God worked a miracle in your life and he's opened up your mind to understand the Bible, not only do you live with forgiveness and visible signs of change, but you've also received the Holy Spirit in your life. That's the amazing part of our faith journey. Every person who repents and receives forgiveness for their sins also receives the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives. When Jesus was speaking, he said in verse 49 that he was sending the promise of his father to the disciples and for them to wait in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Did you hear how Jesus referred to the Holy Spirit? He didn't say a halo is going to surround you. He didn't say there's going to be this nice glow that shows up on your face. He said, go to the city and wait for the power from on high. Everybody say power. power. Say it like you mean it. Power. Power. Jesus said, wait for the power of the Holy Spirit. Wait for the power, the promise of God. And then later in Acts chapter 2 and verse 2, we see this promise fulfilled. The disciples are gathered together. They're praying together. They're reflecting together. Then suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm. And it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each one of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit. If you are new to following Jesus, please understand this. God does not live inside this facility. God does not live inside the chairs. God does not live in the drywall. God is not living in the lights or the cushions. God is not living in the foyer drinking coffee and eating cookies during the week. This building is not a temple of God. If you've surrendered your, your life to Jesus, you are the temple of God. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. 
That's why the Apostle Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. He said in 1 Corinthians 3.16, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? In 1 Corinthians 2.12, he said, do, do you, not, have you, not received, you have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so you can know the things that have freely been given to us by God. The change that you have experienced in your life is that God has moved in. Now, scientifically, I don't know how to explain that. But I do know that the moment I surrendered my life to Jesus, I've never been the same. Like I was changed. And it's because the Spirit of God is living in me. The same power that created the galaxies and the cosmos, that created the world, the oceans, the depths of the sea. The same power that uniquely created every living thing. The same power that rose Jesus from the dead, that same power lives in you. That's why you can live your life with confidence. That's why you can live your life walking every step in victory because God lives in you. Wherever you go, there the Spirit of God is living in you, reminding you of the things that Jesus has taught, reminding you of your hope and leading you to victory. That's why Galatians 5 says, the Holy Spirit produces in our lives love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. You can't produce that. You can't generate that. The Holy Spirit living in you gives you the ability to love. It gives you the ability, the Holy Spirit gives you the ability to be patient with others and show kindness when Paul was writing to Timothy, he said in 2 Timothy 1.7, God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. You have nothing to fear about taking that next step of faith, whatever it is. It may be a step of faith to serve. It may be a step of faith to be baptized. Whatever your next step is, that spirit, spirit of nervousness that you have is not from God. He's not giving you a, a spirit of timidity. But he's giving you that same spirit, that power, love, and self-control. So you do have the ability to control those old sinful desires and tell the boy to sit down inside you and tell the man to stand up. You do have the ability to tell the little girl sitting inside you to sit down and tell the woman of God to stand up because you have the spirit of God living in you. So whatever your next step is, whether it's baptism, whether it's serving, whether it's a call to surrender your life to, to full-time ministry, however God is working in your life, you have everything you need. He's opened up your mind. You've been forgiven. You've demonstrated repentance. And you have the Holy Spirit of God living in you. That's how much God's crazy about you. He's giving you everything you need for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who's called us. Let's pray together. God, thank you for loving us and thank you for demonstrating your grace to us and thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit that's now living in our hearts because when we surrendered our life to you, we, we received that same Spirit, that same Holy Spirit who's changed our hearts and transformed our lives. So Lord, it's our prayer that today, whatever next step of faith is needed among this group of people today, you would allow them to take that next step that your Holy Spirit would lead them to be baptized. Your Holy Spirit would lead them to, to take a, a next step to serve whatever it is, God. We know there's something more to life to do. We know there's something else planned for us because our future is in you. And you didn't save us for no reason. So Lord, thank you for the purpose that you've given to us. Help us to worship you 
and live our lives for you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.